Well, good morning. My name is Eric Thompson. I'm a vice president here at CNA, and I'm the director of the Strategy and Policy Plans Program. On behalf of our president and CEO, Catherine McGrady, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this virtual national security seminar event entitled Critical Minerals, Supply Chains, and Domestic Resilience. Before we begin, I will offer a couple of administrative remarks. Today's event is on the record, and a recording will be available on CNA's website, cna.org, uh, in the coming days. And we will also send all of the participants and audience members a link to the video so that you can share it with your colleagues that were unable to join us today. After a brief introduction from me, I'll hand it over to today's sh uh, moderator, Sharon Burke, and then you get a chance to hear from our panelists. After some initial remarks from our panelists, we will open it up to audience question and answer. So we encourage you to send your questions. For if you're participating via the Zoom link, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and type your questions in there and they'll come right to our moderator and she'll be able to read those for everybody. If you are dialing in directly by telephone, um, I encourage you to go ahead and send your questions in via email to the email address cna underscore nss at cna.org, NSS standing for National Security Seminar. And that's the uh, email address that you got a lot of the announcements for regarding this event. So hopefully it'll be easy for you to find. If this is your first time or your first acquaintance with CNA, we're a nonprofit research organization comprised of the Center for Naval Analyses and the Institute for Public Research. The Center for Naval Analyses is a federally funded research and development center for the Navy and the Marine Corps, but our work uh, supports decision makers across the Defense Department and other US government agencies. Our Institute for Public Research supports homeland security and infrastructure protection, public safety, public health preparedness and response, and emergency operations at all levels of government. Our National Security Seminar Series is a CNA initiative that brings together thought leaders from across US government, academic and research institutions, the private sector, and US partner nations to share their expertise, facilitate discussions, and contribute to an ongoing dialogue about issues affecting US national security. Our theme for this year's series is mobilizing cooperation to advance national security. Competition has been a, the defining paradigm shaping US national security strategy in recent years, but cooperation, both international and domestic, has become increasingly critical to meeting security challenges. Effective cooperation across the interagency and between the public and private sectors will be needed to safeguard homeland security and to enhance the resilience of our networks and infrastructure to a range of threats. At events earlier this year in our National Security Seminar series, experts discussed China's economic activity in the Arctic, how the U.S. can counter PRC and Russian alliance wedge strategies, and just last week, the use of drones in the war in Ukraine. Turning to today's event, the green energy transition, the war in Ukraine, and increased U.S. competition with China all have the potential to dramatically impact the supply chains of critical minerals. Today's discussion will focus on these minerals, what they are and why they're critical, and how they're linked to national security and what actions the U.S. government, specifically the Department of Defense, is taking to help increase domestic resilience. Today, we're honored to have with us CNA's own, the Honorable Sharon Burke, Dr. Sarah Riker, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Najib Locke. Ms. Halima Najib Locke currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for industrial-based resilience at the U.S. Department of Defense. In this role, Ms. Najib Locke is responsible for assessing the health of the defense industrial base and recommending key policies, investments, and actions designed to strengthen the capacity and resilience of the defense industrial base. She oversees the Office of Research Analytics, the Office of Global Investment Review, and the Office of Industrial Base Support. She was, the most, she was most recently in the office of the Deputy Secretary of Defense as Senior Advisor of Industrial Base and Innovation for the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of Defense. Prior to joining the Department of Defense, she served as a Senior Procurement Counsel for the Select Committee on the Coronavirus in the U.S. House of Representatives and the Counsel for the House Armed Services Committee. Dr. Sarah Riker is the Associate Director of Energy and Minerals at the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. Before joining the Energy and Minerals Mission Area, she served as the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science in the Department of the Interior. In addition to holding a position of Deputy AD for Climate and Land, uh, and land Use Change for almost five years, Dr. Riker has extensive ex prior experience with the USGS as a researcher. Additional professional experience, including acting as the Director of the Office of North Africa, Arabian and Middle East Affairs in the Middle East Affairs Bureau at USAID, and roles within the White House Office of Science Technology Policy and the Council on Environmental Quality. The Honorable Sharon Burke is a senior advisor with CNA. She's a leading expert in climate security, energy security, 
Defense and Critical Mineral Issues and served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy and Programs. She is also the founder and president of Ecospheres, a research and advisory firm. She previously served as a, in, uh, in government in Congress, the State Department during the George W. Bush administration, and at the Pentagon during the Obama administration, and was part of the Biden-Harris presidential transition team. I want to preemptively thank our three speakers for joining us today for what is sure to be an informative and thought-provoking event. With that, I'll pass it off to Sharon Burke to get this event started. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, it's just a treat to be here with CNA today, a wonderful organization. Um, and the warm welcome really gets us started on the right note. So I'm gonna just give everyone a quick sense of the agenda and then we'll dive right into the content. We're going to start with a presentation from Dr. Riker, who's going to unpack for us what critical minerals are, why they're critical um, and important, and also the current state of play. Uh, then uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Najib Lak and I will have a conversation about the relationship between critical minerals and national security. What do we actually mean by industrial-based resilience and, and the Department of Defense's role in securing critical minerals? Because it's not a simple question. So we'll conclude after that by opening it up to all of you who are joining us for audience questions. So please be sure to send them in the Q&A feature or over email. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Sarah, but before I do that, I just wanna add one gratuitous comment to that very full uh, a bio that Eric gave us, which is, um, you know, our, our government functions because we have public servants with intelligence and with commitment who have a sense of duty to the American people. And you're very lucky to hear from Dr. Sarah Riker in that respect, because she is one of these people and the US Geological Survey in particular is an amazing agency that most Americans have never heard of. It is a wellspring of information that you can count on and that, that the industry counts on. They're impartial and they're thorough. So the opportunity to start today with some comments from her about with an overview of what, what this issue really is, is just a real treat. And Sarah, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. but you will have to unmute. <laughs> thank you, Sharon, can you hear me? All right, well, thank you so much, what a welcome. And you too have spent your time in federal service. So I, I appreciate it all the more coming from you. Um, also a big thank you to CNA for hosting such a timely event. This is the topic of the moment, but also of a few decades. Um, as Sharon mentioned, I am USGS Associate Director for Energy and Mineral Resources. We are a federal science agency in the Department of the Interior. So we also provide science advice to natural resource managers. As some context for, for our lens into the critical minerals topic, uh, by statute, we assess the, the nation's mineral resources still in the ground, which is sometimes called our domestic resource base or our natural capital. We're also responsible for the nation's data on the global supply, demand, and trade of non-fuel minerals. So that's the part of the supply chain from extraction through disposal. And on the disposal side, we're currently increasing our data collection on reuse, recycling, and reprocessing of mine and other wastes, um, which the bipartisan infrastructure law of 2021 highlighted as the above ground resource. So some, some new terminology emerging on these unconventional mineral resources. So that's the primary lens that I bring to this discussion. We collect data and analyze supply chains, and we advise the other federal agencies that actively make investments in supply chains, developing trade strategies, managing public lands, making foreign and domestic investments. We coordinate that advising through the National Science and Technology Council's Critical Minerals Subcommittee, which the USGS co-chairs along with the Department of Energy and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I know I called it a timely topic, but it is not a flash in the pan. Formal interagency critical minerals coordination launched about a decade ago. And the big accomplishment of that effort's first two years was the formulation of a whole of government approach to defining criticality. So each agency has its core industries and stakeholders and investment focuses, as well as its own understanding of criticality for those sectors. I feel that the big achievement of coming to a holistic approach is not to override those existing priorities, but to fill a gap in the sector-by-sector stovepipe approach. 
So I'll highlight a few examples in the next few minutes here. And first of all, right, I'll highlight a few of the nation's technology directions that depend on minerals. At left here are three low carbon energy technologies, a solar panel, an offshore wind turbine, and an electric vehicle, all tagged with minerals that they depend on, including a number of minerals that we deemed critical when we published the first whole of government list of critical minerals in 2018. And again, when we updated the list in 2022. Right are three of the minerals that are essential to infrastructure. And I will highlight niobium, which has key applications in the steel industry for bridges, pipelines, and gas turbines. Uh, those are some of the most visible applications. But niobium is also crucial to superconducting magnets for MRI machines and in super alloys for automotive manufacturing and aerospace. So the niobium supply has competition across multiple industries and across the globe, and no production in this country. This is pretty much the definition of a critical mineral. Moving on. I, this is a periodic table or a part of a periodic table. Um, in blue are the elements or the, the minerals essentially for which we have sufficient data to track production over time. The darker colors indicate that more of the world's production is concentrated in China. And I'm using China as an example because they've consistently increased production of a number of minerals over decades. So on the table, gallium is at center right and dark blue, that's GA. Um, gallium is an important component of thin film solar PV and we are 100% dependent on imports primarily from China. In contrast, niobium is at center left, symbol NB, and it's shown in white. China produces almost no niobium, like us, China depends on trade. So this USGS analysis indicates, among other things, that niobium is among the most likely minerals to develop head-to-head -head trade competition between the US and China. Neither of us produces niobium, both of us rely on it. In fact, some of that potential for competition is likely increasing. The US has reached a crucial period for infrastructure rebuilding and modernization, and China is building a great deal of new infrastructure. In the bigger picture, damages from natural disasters are increasing worldwide, which increases the need to rebuild infrastructure and demand is increasing in many countries for all the same materials. <laughs> so one larger takeaway here is that even when looking only at trade relationships, each mineral commodity has its own specific features and supply chain issues. There are no one size fits all solutions to all supply chains. this a heat map. This was published in Science Advances about two years ago now. I've updated it since, but this is the prettiest version I'll show you. So the USGS has about 100 years of data on mineral commodities in the global economy, and I'm showing you here one slice through that data set. In the left column are a dozen mineral commodities needed for energy applications. The colors show each mineral supply risk over an 11-year period, and the warmer the color, the greater the risk to the supply chain for that mineral. Second from right, we show the primary country producing each mineral, and at far right, we list the other major uses of that mineral in addition to energy. So if you focus on the second row, the warmery colors show that the supply of cobalt is increasingly at risk. Much of the world's cobalt production is in the Congo, and much of the refining is in China. Cobalt is important to a number of domestic industries. Um, I think most famously currently energy, but even within the energy space, cobalt is used both in lithium ion batteries and in gas turbines, multiple uses. It's also important in aerospace and areas of manufacturing that require cutting and other hard wearing equipment. So domestic industries are increasingly competing with each other and increasingly dependent on the same concentrated cobalt supply overseas. So this is another analysis that to my mind illustrates the importance of cross sectoral analysis. For a number of the so-called energy critical minerals, the highest volume uses are actually in other industries. And that means risks to energy supply chains may actually be driven by other industries demand for the same minerals. So let's see, that was a look at trends over the last decade. And I will close with a look forward at some longer term um, domestic resource potential. This is a map from the USGS Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. 
uh, which is a partnership with the state geological surveys. Uh, the, the foundational problem that this program is meant to solve is that the United States is extraordinarily undermapped relative to other developed nations. So this partnership is a collaboration to identify parts of the US with potential critical mineral resources. Um, this map shows the, the resources still in the ground portion of that, that effort. And it's really focused on uh, minerals important to advanced battery technologies. This is one of our earliest joint products across the federal and state geological surveys, and it is the nation's first map of areas with potential for, um, for battery minerals. We are working to collect data and update our maps to quantify how much of these minerals may be present, not only where they are, and the bipartisan infrastructure law is greatly accelerating our efforts to do so. Um, we are also launching the next phase of this joint effort, pulling our knowledge of mineral resource potential in mine waste across, again, federal and state expertise, and really working to understand the above ground resource as well. We really need to move our understanding of the domestic resource base to the total resource, above ground, below ground, with the entire potential for the cir circular economy. Um, the prospects for increasing reprocessing and, and advanced recycling we are unknowable until we complete more of this mapping of what may be in mine waste at what volume and concentration, what parts of the country. So that is the great project now to develop the national inventory of mine waste. So I will end there and look forward to your questions. And thank you all so much for your, your interest in this space. It is a takes a village problem. We are assembling the village, I think, step by step but it will still be a long time. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you. That was a great overview. I have so many questions for you and I'm sure everyone does. Um, I'm going to move to our defense colleague, but just one, one thing before we do that. Uh, well, first of all, just want to say, I think especially the map really reminds me and hopefully everyone that, that, good information and better information is just as important a policy tool and an investment tool as any other. And so we can't, we can't really uh, develop our comparative advantage in, in these areas without better information. So USGS plays an incredibly important role in that. My, just one question that I wanna leave you with before we go to Halima and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to a discussion is um, the critical mineral list uh, was in 2018, 32 uh, different minerals listed and in 2022, 50, although some of those were actually listed, they just were, I think, grouped. Um, is that list dynamic and, and does it necessarily have everything on it that should be on it? Uh, you know, so just curious about, about what criticality means in that sense and whether that's sort of a moving target. Mm -hmm. That's a key question, I think, especially right now with all of the interest in investing in critical minerals. If the list of critical minerals continues to change, um, we need to come to a good understanding of how that cadence of change relates to investment cycles. And yes, the list absolutely is dynamic. The Energy Act of 2020 called for a review and update to the list at least every three years. And in the 2022 update to the list, there were some changes. Um, as you as you mentioned, the, the original list was um, 35 critical minerals, but also groups of minerals based on what data we had. At the time, we didn't have the granularity of data to break out all of the rare earth elements and all of the platinum group elements. So the uh, critical minerals list for 2022 is actually 50 critical minerals. That doesn't mean that we've had a spike in um, in demand and a, a dip in supply in that three-year period. Um, what it means is that we have better data now and we're able to identify um, specific rare earth elements and platinum group metals. We have also reevaluated um, a few supply chains. We have a handful of changes to the list. Um, but in general, I would say um, the, the key takeaway for this moment with the, the interest in investment is that the list will change, but generally not dramatically as the, as the limited changes between the first two lists um, we shows. There are good Great. reasons to reevaluate and the under, underlying supply chain will shift over time. 
But the list is really not designed to capture every different spike in supply and demand. And that's really to provide stability of planning for, um, for federal industry, for all partners involved. Great. Thank you. Okay, so stay with us. We're coming back to you. But now I'm really delighted and honored to introduce Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Halima Najib Lak, who is um, relatively recently in that job. So you may not have heard of her yet, but remember this is when you did hear about her because you're going to hear a lot more. She is a rising star uh, in, in the U.S. government, and uh, we're so fortunate to be able to talk to her today. Um, Halima, welcome. Thank you for being with us, Madam Secretary. Um, and I'm going to open it up uh, after this to questions from the audience. But if you'll let me, allow me, Halima, I just want to start by saying, so your role is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Base Resilience, a nice long title, must be important. But could you start by sharing with us what industrial base resilience means, you know, for the Department of Defense and beyond? Absolutely. Can you hear me just to make sure? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Madam Secretary. I will always address you as such the honorable. Oh, please call me Sharon. <laughs> oh, absolutely not. But thank you so much for inviting me to this important discussion. And thank you to my fellow panelists for uh, the, the fantastic presentation, because I do think that, and the presentation to come, I do think that this is a topic of uh, critical importance when we're thinking through critical minerals is the reason we call it critical. And so to your question, ma'am, as far as what we in the department think about industrial-based resilience and that meaning, this is something that, you know, we are taking a cue from private industry as far as how you think through an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the national defense strategy calls for an ecosystem, as you all know, and that resilient ecosystem means that we're looking at who all the players are. So resiliency is somewhat of a newer concept for the department, but it really is around describing the attributes such and specifically outcomes of supply chain policies, supply chain risk management as a way that we can really get after resiliency. So when we're talking about resiliency, we're talking about the industrial base and its ability to scale and or you know re rebound from any type of attack, be it cyber or an intentional choke point or choke off of certain supplies that are critical to manufacturing whatever the component is that they're engaged with. So we're thinking through it from an, an, a holistic approach as far as what a resilient ecosystem looks like, and that means we have to learn from industry and make sure we are putting policies in place that assist industry in actually accessing those critical minerals necessary to produce the goods that we ultimately want to buy and buy from trusted sources. So sticking with the big picture for a minute, based on everything you're seeing, how would you assess the health or the strength of the U.S. industrial base today, and and just anticipating that it's not 100% perfect. What are the key factors that are that are negatively impacting the health of the industrial base? That is an absolutely loaded question because it's so many factors. Thank you so much. <laughs> but you know how we assess the health uh, or the strength of the industrial base is really by how the industrial base is able to access their suppliers, access their um, materials, and access the, the needed uh, intellectual property in order to produce what it is that we want to buy. So if, in fact, there is a, as I said before, a choke point or a, a intentional blockage or unintentional blockage because we are dependent on a certain entity, be that another country or just a, a company, right, that single point of failure, then that's not particularly healthy. And we right now see certain areas as more prone to those choke points, and that was highlighted in our report uh, that we published in February in response to President Biden's Executive Order 14017, our report on securing defense-critical supply chains. 
which outlines our strategy and our priorities for strengthening the industrial base. And it really identified five focus areas of, of concern for that health that I think is shared. We already talked about critical and strategic minerals and materials, but batteries and energy storage, microelectronics, castings and forgings, and kinetic capabilities, so like missiles and munitions. So when you're looking at the health of supply chain, I would just um, use the Russian, Russian invasion of Ukraine as a microcosm of a larger issue, which is when we are in a particular uh, dependency on a certain country for energy or the like, and that country then is at war, we are not able to procure those goods, and so that means that our production is negatively impacted and or on the flip if we need to ramp in time of war if there is not, in fact, um, access or the ability to do capital improvements from companies that are in our supply chain to meet the need of whatever that urgent operation is then we need to work on strengthening that supply chain. And you see that through our response to Ukraine. So because the DIB consists of multiple layers or, deer, or tiers in the DIB, we have to work with the ecosystem to understand what their needs are, what they are able to get access to, and, and what they're not. And so key factors that are negatively impacting its health are dependency in large sectors on adversarial countries quite frankly. That is really a key factor that negatively impacts the health of the data. And uh, if anyone hasn't seen the report that Halima referenced um, on the defense critical supply chains, uh, defense supply chains, um, I highly recommend it. And there's a very good section on critical minerals. So Sarah, Sarah over, gave an overview of, of some of the demands in um, energy and infrastructure for these particular classes of minerals. And I know there's also high tech and medical technology and other, um, and other sectors. Uh, but Halima, could you talk to us a little bit about why critical minerals are important specifically to the defense industrial base? Absolutely. So critical minerals, as again, was perfectly laid out in the presentation before, they're so important because they're everywhere. When you think about, um, you know, our lower tier suppliers that are in our castings and forgings, they're dependent on raw materials. So if we can't, if they can't get access to raw material to process, then we're not able to finish off that, um, you know, uh, naval ship. We're not able to finish off a munition or the like. And so critical minerals is of key importance to the defense industrial base and the defense department because without that raw material, you can't actually make the end item. And so we're aware of the U.S. reliance on mineral imports growing, and uh, we know that reducing the dependency is going to be costly with you know, the failure rate that's similar to Silicon Valley because as some of my uh, colleagues and those that are in the area like to say, in the critical mineral space like to say, the rock is where the rock is, right? I mean, it's in the Congo, it's in certain areas. And so we have to deal with that, but still think through the interdependency of our processing facility and our ability to, if we do procure that critical mineral, what do we then do with it? Is it something that in fact we are able to put into certain systems. And so this is a, a key component that we right now are thinking through in the electrification of our vehicles and our fleet and the department, how we're actually able to work with allies and partners to get after our need for lithium. What are we doing? And so there's an interagency um, coordinating body called the FCAB, the Federal Body um, Batteries, and we talk about this exact thing. What are our strategies that we are going to employ down, up and down the value chain? And what are all of the levers that we have to pull? So it is of great importance to the critical minerals, is of great importance to the department, and that's why we're the stockpile owners. We've always cared about this, but now I think it has become acute in public discourse what our dependency is. And so we're really trying to... Um, 
put some money towards expanding domestic capacity where possible. And uh, you you referred to the stockpile, and I, I want to ask if you could expand on that a little bit, just in talking about what what role does the Defense Department pay, play in the overall effort to to change the picture here, um, the reliance, especially, you know, Sarah laid out that the U.S. is in some cases a hundred percent reliant on on imports, net imports, uh, for foreign suppliers, including China, um, and that sometimes is processing sometimes for the raw material. So what what role is the Department of Defense playing in changing that picture? And could you talk about some of the actions you've taken? Like you mentioned the stockpile, but I know there are some other things that you're doing too that are that are really interesting and also um, have a lot of money. So could you talk a little bit about that? Um, absolutely. So as the stockpile manager, um, as I don't know that if as people know that the Department uh, of Defense is the stockpile manager, specifically um, we are the, uh, in ANS, designated as the manager. Um, I'm sorry, just one moment. From sure. Time. And I can just, while we're waiting for Halima to come back, the National Defense Stockpile is uh, is a, an actual, it is an actual stockpile of, uh, of materials that the Department of Defense has designated as strategic and critical. So, and I mean, it's a physical stockpile that's sitting around in places, right, Halima? Yes, sorry about that. Um, that's okay. We know, we know you're busy. We really appreciate that, that you're able to be with us. Um, so yes, the, the stockpile is in fact physical. And so it is something that in um, the wisdom of Congress was started up as a way to actually make sure we have access to materials that go into our weapon systems that we know we on our domestic soil don't actually have the capacity to mine. And so it's a way that we bought down risk and we, we did bulk buys is the way I like to describe the stockpile. So we do bulk buys of certain materials and that the... Um, the balance of the materials in the stockpile shifts based upon needs, but we do work in tandem with Congress and we constantly work with them, for, for instance, on tungsten. If we have enough tungsten in the stockpile, then perhaps we can sell off some tungsten to industry in order to buy another material that is now of greater importance to our needs as far as where our manufacturers for our key weapon systems are having an issue with procuring that raw material itself, we will then buy it and, and the like. And so we're trying right now to work in tandem with Congress to hopefully get more flexibility with the stockpile so that we can reinstitute the transaction fund so that there's a little bit more flexibility without going all the way up the chain and getting congressional relief to sell things off. But the department would then own the ability to actually respond and um, Saying we're going to sell this off and just report that up instead of uh, saying, Mother, may I, when, in fact, if we have the opportunity, because, I don't know, TNT, right, it's, it's, it's impacted right now because there are only three producers of TNT, Poland, Ukraine, and Australia. So if we have the ability right now to buy an ally's TNT because we need it, then we should do that. So things of that nature can be one way that we can use the stockpile more effectively if we were allowed that congressional relief. But we're in conversation there, so more to okay. come there. And I'm sorry, could you repeat your second? Good luck and good luck with that conversation. So in, in addition <laughs> to the stockpile being a, a sort of safety net against supply shocks, you have other tools like the Defense Production Act that, that's been very actively deployed of late. Could you talk to us about how, like some of the highlights of that and how it's working? And, and also it sounds like you've gotten um, the authorization at least, if not the appropriation for a lot more money for Defense Production Act um, efforts. So what what's that tool and how does it work? Absolutely. Uh, so the Defense Production Act um, and specifically Title III of the Defense Production Act, because that's what uh, everyone is probably more familiar with. Although we do have Title I authorities, which other agencies share with us, 
And Title I are the prioritizations in the supply chain, and so that's where we work with our program offices to understand if there is a choke point and we can priority rate with the commercial sector that this is a defense order and so please put these orders on top of your commercial orders because they know that that supplier knows that they're in our supply chain and therefore they have now the legal ability to go to their other customers and say the government needs this so sorry you're now number three in line so that to move them up to number one so that's dpa title one which is very useful but in this context dpa title three that group and in my office is responsible for those large-scale investments necessary to create, maintain, or expand domestic production of materials or uh, critical technologies that are necessary to prevent a natural defense shortfall, right? It's really around if we know we are in a sole source environment, we know we're dependent on a supplier, and they're saying they're going to go out of business because they don't have the ability to... Um, invest in the, the next line for their forging capability, then we will come in and we will make that investment. And so um, the DPA is really leading the charge on domestic investments in critical minerals for, for many supply chains, but as an example, the battery supply chain, right? Within the DOD sense, the Ukraine Supplemental Appropriation already provided $500 million to our DPA Title III program specific to expand mining and mineral processing activities that are impacted by the uh, invasion of Ukraine. So what you see there is because we've already highlighted an oh, let's plug, this is the report, the supply chain report. So, you know, we will uh, certainly email this link out. But <laughs> as we already highlighted in the report, uh, the need for certain critical minerals, we work with our colleagues in USGS and then we prioritize what we can get after. And because this is a systemic issue, we're using the Ukraine supplemental money to target what's impacted by that invasion, but we're buying down the risk because if we're investing right now in this particular mineral, it's not only in one place, it's not only impacted because of Ukraine, it's impacted because we have a dominance on an adversarial country, and so therefore that's going to bleed over into what we can do. And as you said, other appropriations, if they come from the recent authorization of trying to do more investment in um, domestic mining and domestic processing facilities, but also we were trying to convince the Hill to allow us to invest in, um, or rather use DPA authorities for the UK and Australia, because right now we can use them in Canada. And what we are trying to get after is expansion of the DPA authorities would allow us to invest in, say, a second or third tier company in the mining space, critical mineral space, a mine, and perhaps in Australia as an example, that feeds into our OEM's needs. So that way you create redundancy in the supply chain and then we're not dependent on an asset. So that's how we are attempting to use the DPA, but right now we are absolutely expanding domestic capacity. That, um, and that is a very helpful point to, uh, given that CNA's theme for this national security seminar is uh, cooperation. So uh, I'm glad that you brought up uh, other countries because I think, you know, as Sarah uh, said during her presentation, the United States has, a, a, you know, a, a really good endowment with a lot of minerals and prospects for, so to speak, for uh, increasing production, um, both from waste and under the ground resources in a number of places and certainly increasing processing. Although there's a reason it's hard, you know, environmentally, community wise, governance, these things are difficult, but nonetheless, there's a lot of possibility there, but there are also some, some minerals and some processes that, that we don't have a, a good resource for, but we have lots of partners and allies who do. And you talked about Australia and Canada, in the UK. So can you talk, just tell us how important is cooperation in, in critical minerals and in the defense industrial base? What's the role there? And how are you working you know, with US uh, partners now? As in, you mentioned that um, Canada is already eligible for DPA and you're trying to expand that. But is there, are there, and you know, not just limited to foreign governments, but also to private sector partners, are there other ways that 
that you see cooperation playing an important part uh, with your, in your efforts? Absolutely. So I, um, this is a wonderful opportunity to explain the stand-up of our ASD ship within the department. So Congress mandated that industrial policy be elevated to an assistant secretary level organization and renamed it industrial-based policy, which harkens back to its old name, which was MIBP, Manufacturing and Industrial-Based Policy. But it was a DASI level organization. And so in standing up this ASD, we have combined the traditional industrial policy office, or, or historical rather, not traditional, but historical, with the international cooperation office that all reported to the, assistant sec um, the undersecretary for acquisition and sustainment. So in this assistant secretaryship, you now have international cooperation with, you know, the, the resiliency work with industry, all in one kind of home. And we really do uh, communicate. We're working right now on more, even more collaboration. That not that we didn't before, but even more intentional collaboration with our strategies and with making sure the SMEs on, say, the supply chain research and analytics team are able to go with our colleagues in the international cooperation if they're going to talk to our um, partners and allies around a certain issue, being able to engage at that tactical level as well as that strategic level, it's extremely important to find out, one, what is their interest and capacity in working with us on certain items, and two, what can we do to better explain our policies and or allow some flexibility in our policies. So for instance, everyone thinks by American is abroad, they think it's, you know, oh, that means that you want to lock us out. In fact, that's not true. If you are, you know, a, a partner through a trade agreement, you, your industrial base and buying from that industrial base, if a company were to buy and use that as a, a supplier, you are a part of by American. You are considered, you know, meeting that, that requirement. So we're really working very hard to identify more areas where the U.S. can further open up our supply chain bottlenecks, right, and, and start to build better alignment with allies and partners and be intentional about our strategies and how they are um, laid, right, how they are connected. We, we, talk, we call it near-peer shoring. So if, in fact, uh, an ally or partner is the number one, again, T and T producer, then we don't need to necessarily build that domestic market if it's going to take so much capitalization and there's not interest. When they say we can buy from an ally, but maybe there is interest in us expanding production in a certain part of that that value chain. So that will ultimately strengthen America's economic engine. Given, you know, the entire global economy is really better with truly free markets, which are not controlled or influenced by just one country. So that's what we're getting after. And, and I mentioned DPA Taiwan. And I'm sorry I'm, I, if I, my remarks are too long. I'll no, no, it's, it's perfect. I mean, it, there's just a lot here is the, is the issue, yeah. Yeah, so um, I mentioned if- We uh, do have DPA questions Taiwan. though, so, so I'm, I'm okay. ready to fire up when you're ready. Absolutely, but um, I, I'll just say one last thing. Our Title I authority allows us to enter into SOSA, so Security of Supply Agreements with other uh -huh. countries. And so we are now doing um, more robust outreach to other countries to explain that and, and see if there is interest. So we're working with our IC colleagues to say, so we cannot, the way that DPA Title I works is we can compel domestic contractors if you're already on the defense contract, right? You're all we already have a contract with you. We can compel you to prioritize our orders over commercial. We can't do that. And again, the compelling is we we are in communication. Our industrial base are extremely patriotic, so they're happy to meet the mission, absolutely step up. And so it's more so just the formality of we write down you must and they can take that and say, hey commercial entity, we must. So we now we can't do that internationally, but we can enter into these SOSA agreements and say, hey, Japan, you know, you and your supplier base has something that we need. If you, Japanese government, uh, can go and require your industrial base to respond to an American order that we need for defense purposes, we will do the same. If you need something and, and it's a, a, an American supplier, we will work to compel them to meet your needs. And so that creates a virtuous circle, and therefore there's not this feeling of an imbalance, 
but really mm-hmm. that we're working together. Yeah, and I think that's really important, especially because most producers of and processors of these minerals worldwide have nationalized companies where, the, where they have the power of their government behind them. So figuring out how we do that and preserve a free market, as you said, is, is a really important challenge for policymakers. I'm going to start throwing some questions at you. And the first one we got was from Carlton Hill, who said, for those critical minerals that we rely on China for 100% of our supply, do we have a plan for an alternate provider? Should China stop providing this resource to us? And, and of course, that is not a hypothetical because China has restricted exports of rare earth elements in the past. Do we have a plan? Um, Halima, you're nodding. And Sarah, I know you've thought a lot about this too. That's part of the whole point of, of mapping is understanding what, what the, uh, the alternatives are. But that's kind of the whole point of everything that you've both been talking about is making sure that we're not so vulnerable um, to, to the dominate, dominance of one country, but particularly one that we don't have friendly relationships with. So is that, is that fair to say that, yes, we have a plan? <laughs> I will say, yes, we have a plan. Um, I think that that plan is going to take some time to show uh, the fruits of the labor and the investments. I mean, also, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act gave money towards investment in critical minerals, too. So, as you said, more money is flowing in, and that is the plan is investing in domestic capacity expansion. But also, that's where the stockpile comes in handy, where we know where we are in, again, that 100% dependence, which is why we have stockpiled certain minerals. But the stockpile is not infinite, right? We have bought it, and now it might run low, which is why we're trying to work with other allies and partners and thinking through peer shoring and other access points and or alternatives, working with the technology community as far as if there's an alternative to using one mineral over another and maybe that second mineral is in a more friendly country and therefore we can force that and then transition um, from dependence to that tiering, but. Sarah, do you want to add to this too? Because, uh, you know, there there are some things that China just has a geological comparative advantage. And in some cases, it's not just, it's not geological. It's not written in stone, so to speak. Do, do you want to comment on this? I think I'll just follow the rare earth theme. And I think just um, kind of double down on what Helena just said, which is there is a plan for rare earth specifically. That's an interesting case. There was a presidential determination of a national emergency for rare earths a few years ago. And since then, our subject matter experts and Halima's subject matter experts have been collaborating closely to evaluate the the real state of rare earth supply chains, heavy rare earths, light rare earths, um, production, extraction, processing, manufacturing, um, and also to evaluate opportunities to invest in domestic and allied supply chains. So absolutely there is a plan. There's a great collaboration backing the plan and absolutely it will take a while to get fully to a place where that supply chain looks more stable. And whether the goalpost should be to fully onshore the entire supply chain is not my department. That's a policy call that the administration um, is absolutely um, contemplating now in the long haul. Um, but absolutely building up the right partnerships internationally and also across industries and through land managers and permitters and through reprocessing and substitution. Um, it, it is a takes a village problem and uh, the defense community is a big piece of the solution, but not all of it. So um, the interagency collaboration and also industry creativity is a lot of how we're how we are working through that plan now. Um, Halima, your folks have told us many times that once the Defense Production Act experts start making investments in a particular suite of materials and commodities, it takes a few years to start seeing those investments prove out. It takes a while to actualize the project and to see how that really does change the domestic supply chain. So not only will it take a few years, uh, a number of years to stabilize the chain. It'll take a few years to see that, see whether it's happening. So <laughs> we're in a yes, there's a plan. No, we can't promise anything <laughs> state of affairs, I would say. Very reassuring. And 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 I do want to highlight that both of you 
have said repeatedly that increasing domestic production is important, but so is working with partners and allies. And I, and Sarah, the one that really comes to mind is niobium because you you highlighted how important it is, but almost all of it is produced in Brazil or and, and some in Canada. And and right now the United States just doesn't have a resource, so we must collaborate if we want access to this really important resource. And actually, that that that's a good um, blather of mine into Chris Steinitz's question. He said, how good is our data on the demand for these minerals, especially as it changes over time? That is a question I would love to hear the answer to. Um, Sarah, you're lit up. So I think that's, you're, you're going to have to answer that. All right. <laughs> um, and again, I can provide you some of the answer, um, which is that demand, we have over 100 years of data. And so we have a lot of trend data. That said, um, the past does not perfectly predict the future. And so we depend on our partnerships with the defense community, energy community, and others to provide us their outlooks for particular technologies, trajectories. And those are based in part on what investments um, our sister agencies foresee making. If defense knows that they, they are going to need particular technologies, then we can help them evaluate the associated material demands. So we both learn from that exchange. We have the same relationship with Department of Energy. They foresee particular material solutions coming up that increase the efficiency of energy generation and storage. They iterate with us to understand those supply chains. So um, forecasting is, is a tricky space. Um, you know, no one has the perfect crystal ball, but we are throwing a lot of technique and a lot of collaboration at it once again. So do we absolutely know? Well, we have a lot of data and we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of investment plans and those are both good to work from. I think the interagency community, um, I know that we are currently, currently working to improve our scenario development and our outlooks and our forecasts and bring them into a more common framework so that we can more easily look across multiple sectors, projections and outlooks. So it's an area we always need to work on, uh, but we are not pulling numbers out of thin air. Halima, you have a lot more specifics in, in your portfolio that you may, may want to add. Like how do you know what demand system, what demand defense systems have? for for these kinds of materials? How do you forecast that? So because we have a bit of a bounded world when it comes to um, what our, you know, MDAPs are, we do know what the requirements are. And so we are in constant communication with the OEMs. For instance, everyone saw, you know, the magnet piece. Um, I think that the neo-magnets, I think that is a prime example. We know what the issue is. And so that's why we're trying to buy down risk by specific investments. And that oftentimes in the defense sector, while we're thinking about weapon systems or high-end systems that are applicable in an operation for our warfighters, we're, we're not in a bubble, right? What we invest in is going to positively impact the commercial sector and, and our fellow agencies um, because lithium is lithium is lithium. So the fact that we need batteries is good because everyone needs batteries. <laughs> the fact that we, right? So that's um, how our metrics are kind of stood up right now is the defense specific needs. And because we have contracts, that's how we know what to put money towards. But we do work with, you know, um, again, USGS, their list of what the critical minerals are is our, our golden document because they are the experts in this and we are able to say, okay, this is where it is. Can we do something about this? And we are in communication with industry. That's also another way that we have some metrics is to industry will let us know. We'll absolutely wave the flag and say, um, we can't get access to this raw material, right? This is something that they need government intervention for. So that's where the interagency works to advantage of industry. We're, we're just about out of time. I can't believe how fast this, this hour has flown by. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric in just a minute, because we have a number of really great questions in here. And um, I wish we could ask them all. Uh, one from uh, Dan Borges, though, one point that he was making, if I can 
summarize it is that um you know, one of the interesting questions about critical minerals is that, you know, we're, we're looking them at them to fuel the green economy and also our defense <laughs> um, needs. And, and the thing is that there are trade-offs here. So for example, producing critical minerals requires a lot of water, um, you know, and, and so the looking at this as a systems problem and one that's being affected universally by climate change is a big part of, of the picture there. So it was more a comment than a question, but uh, if you both want to fire up a final thought, uh, there were other a lot of other questions that perhaps we can try to address offline um, about, you know, why, why is the net, net import cost so high? And, you know, that's actually pretty easy to answer, I think, as far as is it labor and environmental compliance and or is it geological um, largesse? It's both um, or either depends. It's a mix of things. And I think Sarah said every supply chain is unique. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a sneaky question in here about the Jones Act, uh, which we don't have to answer right now. But uh, again, perhaps another time we can answer these um, uh, about Taiwan and, and its role in the supply chain and choke points. I wish we had time for all of these, but do, do each of you just have a quick closing comment? Uh, we've got only three minutes left. I can't believe it before we turn things over to Eric. Alima, just a quick closing comment, maybe? Certainly. Um, you know, I think one thing that we didn't get into was some of the, uh, the threats to this area. And I think, you know, this is why we're expanding production, right? because we know that there are, one, um, investment strategies that threaten U.S. technology dominance. And because of that, we are really investing in our, our, our screening process as well as uh, for that investment through CFIUS, through the Community of Foreign Investment in the U.S., but as it relates to critical minerals, you know, again, if you don't have the raw material, then the technology can be produced. So we're laser focused on getting to what we call those foundational blocks of our supply chain, and critical minerals and strategic materials are the foundational blocks. And so anything that you all want us to pay attention to, I would just ask, that if you are a business and you have a company or, or you know where we should be looking, please do not hesitate to reach out. We have an RFI process through the DPA, and so right now we are open. We have an open announcement. You can submit a white paper of what your offerings are in the processing or if you have an idea of somewhere that we should look or an industry day that we should hold, we absolutely take that feedback seriously and we will then act on it. So please do look at the DPA website and respond to our RFI. Right now it's live specific to the uh, invasion of Ukraine, but like I said, it's it's connected. It's truly interconnected. So thank you very much for this. Thank you so much for joining us. Sarah, any last quick thoughts? Sure. I actually am appreciating a note in the chat about, um, about the challenges, the environmental and community challenges of um, extractive industries. Um, we hear a lot from industry about the um, loss of social license to operate because of these concerns. And absolutely, this is a core conundrum right now. Many of the paths forward toward low carbon energy generation and storage are remarkably minerals intensive. And so ensuring a, a high quality supply chain and a clean energy focus is a real core challenge. Um, we are also thinking a lot about what a high quality trade supply chain means. And we are getting constant inquiries about, um, about um, allied and aligned countries versus um, countries and industry um, players that engage in forced labor and environmental practices that we don't necessarily want to offshore, even how we don't want to onshore them. So. Uh, there's a whole a whole body of work in this space, and I think I'll just close by saying the Department of the Interior has launched an interagency working group on mining reform that aims in part to move some of the land managers and permitters um, um, approach into a more proactive stance and examine what are the right requirements, um, what is um, what is a good environmental practice in any portion of the minerals industry. The long discussion right now of standards and measurements and trade-offs. And I would say ultimately, 
we are all talking about sustainability, economic sustainability, um, water resource sustainability, you know, te technological directions, and our energy system sustainability. Sustainability is a trade-off of resources, and we are facing that very pointedly right now. Thank you, Sarah. So you got it there, folks. Sustainability and security. Over to you, Eric, for the closing, closing thoughts. Great, thanks. We've reached the top of the hour and I appreciate everyone hanging in there that could. Um, this has been a truly, really, really informative conversation on a, a national security critical issue area. So I'd like to thank all three of our panelists uh, for participating today, uh, for Dr. Riker and, and Dazdi and Ajit Block. Uh, you brought immense uh, energy and expertise and experience to this conversation. And Sharon, thanks for facilitating a really, really illuminating and, and, and informative uh, session. I'd like to thank everyone who joined in the audience today. If this is a return to you for CNA, thanks for coming back and, and being part of this ongoing dialogue. And if this is your first time connecting to CNA in our National Security Seminar Series, we look forward to having you back soon. Uh, one final word of thanks to Kaya Haney, who was our program director for this particular session. She did a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure we could all get together and have this conversation. So thanks, Kaya. And thanks everyone who was involved in this conversation today. It was great to have you here. Uh, I thank you for your time and, and your interest, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.